the doctor's opinion when he says you're doomed unless you do this. Just give it a shot. Don't be a bitch. <laughs> I was talking about how much pain I was in before, but I railed down to ibuprofen 800, so I'm ready to go. You're still an addict. <laughs> you need to call your sponsor. When I'm asked to speak, I often quote this paragraph, because this is the one that really puts my entire life in perspective. It describes my problem, and it tells me my solution. And it was broken down so simple to me that a complete moron like myself could finally comprehend what they were saying. And it says men and women drink essentially because they like the effects produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. To them, the alcoholic life seems the only one. They are restless, irritable, and discontent unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. I'll stop there. But the men and women drink essentially because they like the effects produced by alcohol. I get it. That was me. Why did I do it? Because every time I did something new, it felt awesome. The first time I got a good buzz off beer, it was awesome. The first time I did a little coke, it was awesome. I wasn't doing anything because I, I had to. I was just doing it because it felt great. And the cessation is so elusive that while they admit it's dangerous, they cannot after a time differentiate the truth from the false. When it became the time that if I do this, I'm going to fail my probation test. I'm probably going to jail. My family will leave me. My wife will hate me. I might get fired. But that sensation is so elusive that I know bad stuff is going to go down if I snort this pill. But I have to do it. The restless, irritable, and discontent, right? Like, so white knuckling. So to me, it's like when I try to stop on my own willpower without like a program of, of recovery, like you take the alcohol and drugs away from me, I, I automatically don't get better, right? Get I worse. become eventually like I might hit like a pink cloud phase where like I'm proud of myself and like I'm doing it, right? But all of a sudden I start getting restless, irritable, and discontent until I, unless I can experience that ease and comfort, which comes by taking a few drinks or a few drugs. Right. So like if you can identify with that, like you're you're one of us and seeing others take it with impunity was always a cop out for me. Oh, yeah. If I'm with the girl and she can drink wine and not end up in jail or lose her job, I can probably do it this time, too, because I don't even like wine. So I'm going to drink some wine and that's it. Or I don't really like Coke at a party. But when it comes out, I see everyone sitting around in a circle and doing it. They all got good jobs and they got their lives together. They can do it. I can probably do it just like them. If I just do the same amount as them, everything's going to be okay. And that was always a reason to try again. Mm -hmm. You know, I need a substance I don't really like, like Adderall. At first, I didn't like it, so it was good because I wouldn't abuse it. I only take one a day <laughs> until it came to the point where I had to take tons of them every day. But I seen other people taking it daily. So I figured, why can't I? So in, in the same paragraph that Leroy just read, he stopped short. Uh, I'm going to finish it off. But it says, after they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do... The phenomenon of craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over unless this person can experience an entire psychic change. There is very little hope of his recovery. Okay, let's talk about the stages of a spree and the remorse first. That phenomenon of craving develops. I have to do it. And my sprees always end up in jail yeah but no matter what i'm going to go through it i know every time i do this it leads me to the thing i like the most which causes the most damage and the most overdoses and the most car crashes and i know eventually i'm going to end up in jail every time i go through that spree and it's over and i'm picking up the phone to make that call i swear to god i'm not doing it again i feel horrible like i can't believe i did this again i hurt so many people i caught so many charges I swear I will never do this again. I have a firm resolution. Like you say, you can take that lie detector test that I am never going to do this again. And then it's repeated over and over. Right. And like that's, and my sponsor pointed out to me, that's the insanity that they talk about in step two. That's the uh, insanity that we want to be restored from. Whenever I'm with my clients, I always give them this like kind of funny breakdown of this. So it's like, you ever have that one friend, you know, let's just say for, for the podcast sake, it's a guy friend, right? And they're dating this girl and the girl's like cheating on them and using them, right? So I'm gonna use Leroy for example. And I'm like, hey Leroy, like your your girlfriend, like she's cheating on you, bro. Like and, and, and Leroy's in such 
self-denial because he doesn't want to experience that pain and he doesn't want to face the, the, the reality of it. He's like, no, no, can't be my girlfriend. And I'm like, like, Leroy, like, here's my phone. Like, I... I, I seen her at the gas station and she was jumping in his car's, you know, this guy's car and I, I video recorded it and Leroy's like, no, that's not her. And I'm like, isn't that her tattoo on her leg? And he's like, no, that's not it. And I'm like, isn't that her license plate in her car? And he's like, no. And then he's like, you know, maybe that's like um, her coworker and she was just getting like some, borrowing some money from him or something. You know, uh, he was just helping her do something. And I'm like, all right, Leroy, like here's the car, like jumping up and down. Like they were doing something in there. And then, like Leroy's just like, the insanity is like, you know, the reality of the situation, right? But like, the mental block that our disease has over us, right? Like we know what's going to happen deep down in our soul if we put it, if we pick up that first one and the phenomenon of craving kicks off. But like the, the insanity behind it is, is like I said, the disease overrides all logic. So we do the first one, the phenomenon of craving happens. We go on this nasty run. And then as, as we start to kind of like come out of it, we stop with this firm resolution never to do it again. And we mean it. We could pass a lie detector test. We don't want to do it anymore. Right. But our disease doesn't work like that unless we can experience an entire psychic change like Dr. Silkworth says. The the word psychic change, like step 12, our spiritual awakening, same thing, right? Unless we can experience a spiritual awakening, there is very little hope of our recovery. Without like working any any program or recovery and without this spiritual solution that this book offers, right? We're going to keep repeating this experiment over and over and over and over again. And we'll tell ourselves every time this time is going to be different. Yes, of course. Every time, every time is going to be different. The only thing different is actually jumping into this program, getting a sponsor, going through the 12 steps the way it's outlined in this big book, and then having this entire psychic change. It even says it right here. Dr. Silkworth is telling you who's a professional in, in, in alcoholic and drug addiction, right? He's telling you there's very little hope. Really, it's just say there's no hope. If you're, if, you ha if you're the real alcoholic and the real drug addict, there is no hope unless you work this program and have an entire psychic change. And the psychic change part. So I read this paragraph. Everything makes sense. The pieces are finally going together. I do drugs because I like the way it feels. The effects are so good. I don't care if I go to jail or I die. You know, this is just the life I was chosen. I'm a junkie. You know, this is the way it is. I get restless, irritable, discontent. I go and do it. I go through the stages of a spree. I do all this. That all makes sense. And then it comes to this line about a psychic change. And I'm like, what? the hell's a psychic change and i had to do some research psychic meant relating to the soul or the mind and things started to click because my mind has been telling me for years it's okay to steal it's okay to lie it's okay to do whatever you have to do so you feel different and my soul was it was angry it was full of hate it was judgmental and jealous and just all these negative feelings that was my soul so to find out that I can be cured if I change that, it finally made sense because this is where my problem was deep down in here. And my mind told me I need to do whatever it takes to numb these feelings down here. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, it was like, boom, I get it. And like, so like you said, you said there, right? Like if I could change that, well, like that's, that's also the great news of this program, right? That's the, the great information that this program offers is no human willpower can relieve me of my alcoholism, right? So the only action I could put in to, to this program and, and having this entire psychic change is the action is going to a meeting, finding a sponsor asking the sponsor to sponsor you and take you through the 12 steps as outlined in this book. And by going through the process, we don't do anything. The sponsor doesn't do anything besides take us through the 12 step. We tap into this, this power that's greater than ourselves that Dr. Silkworth was talking about. And this power greater than ourselves does the work for us. It's what produces the, the entire psychic change, the spiritual awakening inside of us. So it's not like we have to like go through like, you know, these great leaps and bounds to have this happen. We just have to put in, you know, honesty. We have to be honest. We have to be willing and we have to put in some action. Somebody says it, it's reading some pages with the sponsor and doing a couple inventory and, and making amends. Right. Like it, it's that simple. All right. So like the, the next paragraph, right, it says, on the other hand, and as strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only effort necessary being required to follow a few simple rules. Right. So like that was my experience. I was doomed. I, I, I accepted that I was doomed. 
I had so many problems, I despaired that I would ever solve them. But like once I accepted the the, the program that's outlined in this book and I had my entire psychic change, um, my desire from alcohol was removed. My desire for drugs was removed. The only thing I had to do was follow these few simple rules. And to me, the, the few simple rules was getting a sponsor and going through the 12 steps the way it's outlined in his book. And then we're going to go on real quick. And it says, men and women have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. Faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must feel, sometimes feel inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it is often it is often not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce an entire psychic change. I'm a therapist in a treatment center. I'm a clinical outreach coordinator in a treatment center. And time and time again, like I'm dealing with people and clients and, and their families, right? And like I'm trying to like ex explain to them, you know, if you have this condition, if you are powerless over drugs and alcohol, you have the disease of addiction or the disease of alcoholism, get a sponsor, go through the steps. And I, I share examples of to them of how my life was. Like I, I was doomed. And if you ever hear my story and I did a podcast with Leroy where we talk about parts of my story, mostly like we did the jail version, a lot of stuff that happened in jail because we wanted to be like kind of funny. And but like it, like people that hear my story, like I, I always express and go deep in depth with the powerlessness because I want them to identify with that. Right. So like the, the newcomer is the most important person in the room. And if they come to this program and it's maybe their first time in a meeting, maybe it's their hundredth time in a meeting, but they're, they're not accepting the fact they're powerless over drugs and alcohol. And they keep repeating that experiment that we just read. They come in and they can identify with, with my story and, and the, the powerlessness. Right. And they're like, wow, like me too, me too. They're willing, right? Like myself, we become willing once we have, we can identify with the, the powerlessness, right? We can identify with the allergy of the body, the phenomenon of craving, we can identify with the obsession of the mind, right? We can identify with the, the insanity that we just read in the paragraph we just read. You know, once I can identify with that, and then you start talking about there's a solution that that removes that from me, and it's a spiritual spiritual solution. A lot of people come in with reservations know, towards the program because they think it's about Jesus or yeah. just things they had already experienced in their life and don't realize that's different. Mm -hmm. But you have to admit, like, even like I came in with like a, a re reservation and I came in with like resentment towards God. Like, even when you start talking about this spiritual solution and there's that little bit of a glimmer of hope, that's all I need. And like steps two and three, like the way they're outlined, right? Like they're not this big step we have to take and like all of a sudden, poof, we have to believe in like Jesus or like Buddha or Allah. They're like little steps that crack the door open. And like, I love in um, the 12 and 12 for step three it says if we crack the door open god does the rest in, in opening up the door and that's been my experience and i'm sure leroy can identify with that because he's he's shaking his head up and down in order for me to accept some kind of spiritual help i have to identify with step one and powerlessness because if i still think i have some control and i could do it like my human willpower could do it myself i'll do it again and it's time it'll work yes right like i'm the insanity is just going to stick in my mind the obsession of the mind is going to keep you know in my in my my own voice the obsession of the mind is going to keep on attacking me and t it's going to keep telling me it's going to be different this time. Geo, it's going to be different this time. You got 60 days sober. You got 30 days sober. The family's starting to believe in you again, right? Like you you got a decent job again, right? The, the probation officer is saying that she thinks you're going to make it this time. You might get finished <laughs> early. Yeah. We might give you early termination, right? Just keep doing good, right? And they're all trying to like put some positive affirmations in your life. Right. But it doesn't work <laughs> when the obsession of the mind comes in. It's like, hey, Gio, you're doing really good. You got 29 days sober. You can go pick up your 30 day chip tomorrow and then you know pick what? up a Roxy. <laughs> you should celebrate right now. Yeah. By going to get a blue pill. Right. <laughs> by going to get a drink by by one hit one this. Right. And that's the way the obsession of the mind's always going to continue to attack us by telling us we could do one more and we can control it this time. It's going to be different. So the human power, you know, something more than human power for somebody who's new to this program or even me. I was in this program 13 years ago before I started again. The human power, something bigger than me just didn't make sense. I just had no concept of it. I I couldn't believe in it because I didn't know what it was. And I was told to just start praying. Kid last night, he went to the meeting and he was a complete, absolute mess. But he said he heard something that resonated and he wants to come back next week and he's excited. Tell them, go home and pray tonight. If you don't understand this power greater than yourself before you go to sleep, you can call him whatever you want. But I started saying, God, to God, thank you for getting me through another day. 
Thank you for keeping me sober. Thank you for giving me this place to live. Thank you for the family I still have left. Thank you for everything. And when you wake up in the morning, ask God for the courage, the energy, and the strength to get through another day. Please watch over me. Please guide me in the right direction. Please help me make the right decisions. Thank you for everyone in my life. That's done. If you do that seven days in a row, come back and talk to me next Saturday. Tell me if you don't start to feel that there's a power greater than yourself. Because it's it's that simple. That's cracking the door open. Saying that little prayer, thanking God at night, and then asking for help the next day. If you do that, it starts to work. And I've dealt with so many people that aren't even willing to do that. Like, it's the absolute minimum amount that will get the ball rolling in an unbelievable direction. But I can't force you to believe. I can give you every bit of knowledge that's in my head, everything I've been through, the misery I suffered, the way I hated life, and the way I feel now. I can tell you everything, but I can't get you to believe. Just starting off small in these little tiny prayers, just doing it day after day, something changes inside, and it starts to make sense. If that's one thing I could stress to absolutely anybody out there who's new to this, or even if you're not new and you're still struggling, start with prayer. It makes such a difference. What else do you have to do? You got nothing else going on in your day. You can find a couple minutes to pray at night. <laughs> you can find a, a couple seconds to pray in the morning. And that is the start of having that power greater than yourself take over and guide you in the right direction. I agree with that, right? And like I do see, I would say it's probably half and half. Some people come in willing to, you know, accept the, the spiritual terms that's in this book and put in some action behind it. And then there's some people that come in, they want nothing to do with the God thing. And it, it's simple, you know, you if you're working with the sponsor, dependent on the person and the situation and the resentment or the reservations or the, the lack of beliefs or, or the beliefs, the sponsor should have some knowledge of how to kind of crack that door open. I've heard people say like, hey, do you believe that I believe? The sponsor will say, yeah, I believe that you believe in God, right? And it could be that simple. Okay, just believe, you know, just believe that in the fact that I believe in a, a power greater than yourself and myself and it will heal you. Like I've heard people like they say, write down what you want God not to be on one side of the paper and write down, you know, what you would like God to be on the other side of the piece of paper and rip it in half, right? And you throw away and you discard everything that you don't want God to be, right? And then you use what you want God to be. For some people, it could be the universe. Like I've heard some people use music. I've heard some people believe in like good orderly direction. Um, group of drug addicts. Group of drug addicts. I mean, I've heard so many like things used to help somebody in the, the very beginning. You know, like the very end of the book and the spiritual experience found in the appendix, it talks about like contempt prior to investigation. That's something good to read too if you're struggling with um, the whole spiritual concepts found in this book and then the higher power in prayer. And it talks about, I'm already saying something's not going to work before I even attempt to try. And I don't know how many times like we've done that in, in our lives in other, other matters. And then we find out by not trying to do it the way that we were told to do it that's why we didn't get any results and once we like put our pride down put our ego down and did things the way that you know we were told to do them they actually worked and we got the results if so many people are telling you so many different religions are telling you that there's power in prayer that there's something out there like who am i to say that there's nothing out there and not at least even attempt to try to see if it's real. Just attempt to try to see if it's real. But here's another thing. You know, Dr. Silkworth in that, that paragraph we just read, he talks about how these alcoholics were doomed. And we're going to use the word drug addicts too because me and Leroy are in Drug Addicts Anonymous. Hell yeah. Right? But I always tell my clients this when I'm talking about the doctor's opinion. So when they first get there, they have to get their, their, their blood taking within like the first 24, 48 hours. You know, after their blood work comes back in, you know, the doctor calls them in to go over their results with them. And I said, imagine getting your blood work done when you first got in here. And they sit down are like hey we got your blood results in and um unfortunately like you are doomed you have this illness <laughs> and you are doomed unless you take this pill every day you hear the doctor telling you that you're doomed unless you do this every day you're like all right doc like i'll do it like i'll take this pill every day you know that feeling like of the doctor telling you that you're you're doomed that despair that powerlessness feeling right that helplessness feeling that you feel if you feel that in your drug addiction and and your alcoholism right and we're telling you like hey you have to do this this thing every day and you have to work this program every day this thing is going to be removed from you you're going to become recovered past tense recovered if you do this 
And then after you you become recovered, the only thing you have to do is reach your hand back out and help another drug addict or alcoholic. If you have that same feeling when a doctor's opinion is telling you that you're doomed from this alcoholic illness, drug addiction, you're going to be willing to do it. You're going to be like, okay, like you want me to say like a stupid little prayer every day? You want me to thank God for like keeping me sober today? Like, okay, I'll give it a try. I'll try for seven days, Leroy. Let's see if this God thing is real. And, you know, Leroy's telling him like, like, come back and tell me. He's not saying like forcing it down your throat, saying God's real and pray every day. He's like, hey, excuse experiment, see if this happens. You know, if you do the seven days, see what happens, come back and tell me what happens. My sponsor kind of did the same thing with me. I was a little bit more open to praying, but you know, I got the results. If I didn't get the results, I wouldn't be here almost 10 years sober. Let's see. I'm a couple months away from being 10 years sober, right? Like I, it, someone's getting a special cake. <laughs> Our sponsorship family likes to buy. Um, I don't think you could say it. Really obscene cakes for each other on anniversary, and I tell them, I beg them, please don't get me a cake. I think you guys got me a rainbow cake last year. No, pink. I they got gave me a pink you cake. the pink cake that said Geo another year. Oh, so it's it was a- abbreviated for gay. Yeah. So yeah, we we that was clever. No it was one. clever. It was clever. It's just it's funny when we do it to you guys, and then when it's you're the one getting the inappropriate <laughs> cake. It sucks. So we constantly say this is a spiritual program, which at first I didn't understand. But I had it explained to me that just sit down and think about a relative you cared about that's no longer here. And think about a good time you had with them. And think about it for like 60 seconds. And I'm thinking about it and I'm feeling happy and I'm remembering that good time. And then I take a little break and I think about the bad time when I found out they had passed. And I think about that for 60 seconds. And all of a sudden I feel sad. And like I feel something inside that's not right. And I'm starting to feel miserable. Well, nothing actually changed except my thinking about this thing I can't see. That is entering the spirit world. They had passed on and it's my memories that either made me feel good or made me feel bad. Simplest way I can think to explain a spiritual program. If your brain is focused on the bad stuff you did and the negative, you're going to feel awful. If you can adjust your brain to think about the good stuff that's out there and the good possibilities and changing everything in your mind, this starts feeling different. It's amazing. It's just physically nothing has changed. But if I think about these good times, I feel good. If I think about these bad times, I feel bad. I'm just now changing what's in here to think about good things to change the way I feel in here. And it's absolutely no manual labor. It's all taking place in here. And that's when the magic happens. If you can identify, you know, and I know me and Leroy, like we can honestly probably keep going on the doctor's opinion and get a couple hours out of it. Like there's so much more and we didn't really go the into as much depth as we wanted to. One day. But one day, right? We'd probably do a, a series in a couple parts. And like, I know I want to do Bill's story, break it down in modern terms, make it fun. Absolutely. But I will say this, like if you can identify with, with the aspects that me and Leroy are talking about and you can identify with you know, feeling hopeless. You can identify with, you know, once you put one in your body, you kind of go on this, this run, right? This spree, you have this phenomenon of craving, this allergy, this abnormal reaction. Maybe you're not fully understanding the the concept there yet, but you, you, you can identify with, you know, once you put one in your body and you only mean to use one that you keep using, or if you're trying to stay sober and you just keep obsessing about using and you eventually give in despite like all the consequences, right? If you can identify with that, then most likely you're powerless over drugs and alcohol. A lot of us didn't want to admit that, right? Like to me, when I read the 12 and 12 and step one, the first paragraph hit me so hard. It says, who cares to admit complete defeat? Practically no one, of course. Every natural instinct cries out about the idea of personal powerlessness. So when I read that, I'm like, wait, none of you guys wanted to come in here and like just totally like we're like willing and ready to like do this. Like a lot of you guys came in kicking and screaming like the group was like, yeah, like we didn't want to admit we were powerless either. So like when I seen that, like it kind of allowed me to kind of like surrender a little bit, right? Like kind of like like I practiced some acceptance and I was like, wow, like I thought I was different. Like I thought I was the only one that came in kicking and screaming and not wanting to do this stuff. I once seen someone pick up their seven year medallion and I stole what they said. I've been saying it ever since. And like, this is probably three or four years ago, going on four years now. He said, AA is the best thing I never wanted. And I remember when he said that, it hit me so hard and I've never heard anybody say it. I've heard people since then say it. I still wanted like my the, my life beyond my wildest dreams was being able to continue drinking and drugging with no consequences, with no <laughs> withdrawals, right? Like having no arrest. Money. Yeah, right. Like 
that was my life bound, my wildest dreams and addiction. And the reality was like once my sponsor had me write down my step one and, and put my experiences on paper, the reality is I end up in jail. I end up destroying my life over and over again. I end up hurting family. I end up losing girlfriends, losing, you know, the losing relationships. jobs, crashing cars. Yeah, right. Like the, the, the reality of the situation is not like my mind. The delusion that my mind makes up is that one day I'm going to regain control, right? So like if you can identify with any of the stuff that we're talking about, you know, there is a solution and there is hope. You know, the biggest thing is getting out of your own way, being willing to walk into an Alcoholics Anonymous or Drug Addicts Anonymous, or even if you like NA, right? Narcotics Anonymous meeting, some kind of 12 step fellowship, you know, having the courage to walk in there, raise your hand and say, I need help. Get a sponsor who knows the book, whatever program you work in AA and, and DAA, we use the Alcoholics Anonymous book, right? Narcotics Anonymous has their own book, but whatever program it is, getting with someone who's walking the walk, right? Whether it's inside the meeting or outside the meeting, that they're doing the right thing, that they know the book, they know the 12 steps, and they've had a spiritual awakening as go you know, by going through the 12 steps the way it's outlined in, in the book and getting with that sponsor and being willing to take suggestions, being willing to put the work in, you know, like I mentioned contempt prior to investigation, it's like not writing anything off. If the sponsor, like, like Leroy gave the guys to the suggestion, the suggestion of, Hey, pray like a simple prayer every day for seven days. Right. So like if the sponsor is like, Hey, pray this prayer every day for seven days, think about like the desperation that we have to come in with. And like the doctor's opinion, when he says you're doomed, unless you do this. So like, uh, like I tell my clients if if the doctor calls you in and he's going over your blood work and he's like hey you're doomed unless you take this pill every day look at it the same way i am doomed unless i have an entire psychic change well you know what the only way to have the entire psychic change is going to a meeting getting a sponsor that's in the meeting having him take you through the work which is found in our book going through the 12 steps the way it's designed not like picking and choosing which parts i want to do go through the process exactly the way it's designed and then it's guaranteed right it's guaranteed we'll get the result which is the entire psychic change which which removes the obsession to drink and drug. And then we have to practice our maintenance steps from there. And that's, it's simple, helping another person, helping another person go through the work. But the great thing is we talked about the word altruism is once I go through the work and I have that entire psychic change and my, my, my mind has been revolutionized. The book talks about being rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence. Once that happens, taking someone else through this work, it's not like a bad thing to do. Like it's not like a burden to me in my time, right? Like I'm so ecstatic that I've, I've been giving another chance at life that I want to take other men through this program and the same for women they want to take people through this program and they want to see that light come back in their eyes it talks about that that's the bright spot of our lives today is helping a newcomer and don't wait until it gets as bad as it did for us because both of us realized we finally had a problem in the same jail in the same situation believing we were not going to ever see freedom again and was done with life you don't have to wait till you get as bad as us and yeah. if you're in detox and you're rehab make this your last time because i promise you it's not going to get better and just like we said we talked about doing this over and over and over that used to be possible but today with the drugs that are out there there's a good chance you're not going to make it and you're not going to have that chance to do it over and over again just give it a shot it's as simple as that i don't know how else to say it just give it a shot it's that simple you know just give it a shot don't be a bitch <laughs>